Pat Fahey, Tom Burke. You yeah. fished down here when you were young guys. Sure yes. did. And we're down at the bridge at Westport House now. Is there a name on this bridge by the way, is there? What did you call it when you were young? The bridge? It was the Short Grounds Bridge. Well, that's how I knew it. Yeah. Because this was the way into the Westport House Short Grounds oh. when we were children. And you'd know what year did that finish? Was it around 1983? Around that time, yeah. But um, it, the fishing was good here then, it was? The fishing was really good down here. And what did you get? We used, we used to, get to get sea trout. trout. We, you, would, you would get sea trout late in the year in about September into October. They used to come up. Um, at that time of the year as well, we used to fish in town when the river rose for eels. All of us used to fish for eels. For some reason, it was something that probably when you learn to fish, you learn to fish with the worm. And one of the big, uh, one of the fish that you would take first was the eel. Mm. First fish I ever caught was a trout. But I'll always remember the first one that I actually remember myself was an eel, mm. which I brought home. I put it on the stairs, and some German guy had taken the head off the eel. And my <laughs> mother nearly killed me. I was only about six at the time. Uh, but down here. So you had the eels and sea trout. Eels, sea trout, brown trout. Uh, we used to go hand netting on the river here, mm. and you would get. Um, four, uh, seven spine stickleback and 14 spine stickleback, I think. Um, one, you'd always know the males from the female because there was a red kind of tinge on the side. Um, and you'd always see if they had eggs because they had a pouch. Um, so it was quite easy to know the difference. And there was thousands of them on the river. Would there be the salmon? Thing, oh, there was never any salmon in my time. I remember Brian Hope catching two sea trout in town one day, one evening in September when we were about 12 or 13 years of age. We were fishing for eels, but um, we weren't worm fishing that day and we got sea trout as well. Um, we actually learned to fly fish on the river here. Myself and Brian and several other lads, Dave Duffy, um, what do you call it? Owen the Grail and a few of the other lads that were in my class, um, Alan Kennedy. We all learned to fish on this stretch of water. Now what period of time are you talking about? You're talking from around late 1970s into the mid 80s. We all learned to fish around that time. And of course we all joined the Trout Club and went out fishing on Lot Mask or any of the other local lakes like Moher. Um, or if you went down to, to Clogher. Um, some of us would have fished on Beltraw during the spring for salmon mm. and then you'd also go down to Barashul. So every one of us would have had an interest. And I suppose every class there was eight or ten of us that would have gone fishing regularly. But the river here was totally different to what it is today. In what way was it different then? Looking over the bridge here, it was always fairly deep here. The water was always fairly deep. What? Oh, the water was always <laughs> fairly deep here. So you always had a pool along this stretch here. Mm. But as you went down, the river narrowed between that tree and that tree, and there was a, almost like a narrow where the channel in there, yeah. Channeled through, and it got faster, and then it went down further. And about 150 meters down, there's another weir and it used to get nastier as you went down because at that time there was no sewage in Westport and we used to actually fish behind Hotel Westport because the biggest trout that you would get in the town area of Westport was down below Westport, or the town Hotel Westport. As you went through the town, if you, if you look up the river there, the river had a much narrow, um, diameter to what you can see there now yeah and behind that tree there where we now have the leisure center there was a little lake called Pulacopo where we none of us were allowed to go up to Pulacopo do you remember Pulacopo? I do. Pulacopo was a lake that there was a legend that yeah. it would swallow you up if you went into it that a horse was swallowed in it I don't know what the legend exactly stated but Every child in Westport was warned not to go near Pulacopo. But that lake used to flow down behind. You can see there's a few stones up there. There was a weir there. And behind that tree, there was a little river flowing into it. And where that river flows in was a really good spot for fishing as well. 
and if you went further up again, in by the all up along the crescent, you had, you had a lot of pools and riffles, fast water where it was highly oxygenated. That's where we did a lot of our hand netting as children. So what changed big time? Do you think this caused Westport? was a town of maybe two and a half thousand people when I was a child. Mm. It would increase to three to four thousand during the summer. Um, the Sea Anglin Festival was all we had at that time. And we had the we also had the horse show and the trials that were done in here for the Dublin horse show. But Westport wasn't biggest a very big tourist town. A lot more houses, an awful lot of B and B's. Mm. The population of the town over the weekend can grow now from maybe 6,000 to 12 or 14,000. Mm. During the summer that could increase to close to 90,000 during, during a Saturday night. So there's been a lot of progress. I'm not saying it's bad, but over time Westport has changed. The river has a lot, had a lot of pressure on it and if you look if you bring the camera up close here, you can see the green algae mm -hmm. and um, a lot of fungusy looking material there. It's not very healthy looking. Mm. We never saw that as children. Uh, a lot of rivers nowadays, you have green slime, um, you have various other types of weed mm. that has actually been introduced over the years. Now what causes green slime? Nutrients, is it? Nutrients, um, eutrophication caused by nutrients in the water, mm. which has flown down, uh, has come down, I won't say from agricultural effluent, but mm. there's bits a of lot er, of pressure bits of everything, on land yeah. today. Mm. There's a lot of pressure on land today. Agriculture has moved on in leaps and bounds since we were children. Mm. Um, while we don't live in a highly agricultural area, mm. um, farmers today are using a lot of nutrients um, in the production of um, Grass, yeah. grassland and whatnot, and that has had a big, big impact on the river here. Mm. Um, yeah, fresh water, yeah. Crayfish. And they're a good indicator of. They're a good indicator, the highest indicator of water quality you can have. Are they? Yeah. No. Then uh, gamarus, which is the little, you know, the little uh, shrimp that you get in fresh water. Yeah. Gamarus. Gamarus is a very high indicator. The next highest indicator would be the mayfly, and then you have stoneflies oh. and you have um, so, so flies and various others. Yeah. Was there some talk about freshwater mussel as well, is he? Um, on the own we, we have Margatifera Margatifera, which is the freshwater pearl mussel. On this catchment there used to be, and there possibly still is, on Ballin Lock and on Napa Beg Lake, they may still have swan mussels. Swan mussels are around that size. Um, they're the largest freshwater bivalve in Ireland. Mm. And then you have Margatifera Margatifera, which looks exactly, unless you look closely, you would swear you were looking at a mussel, um, saltwater um, mussel, mitilus ed edulis. Um, but they're actually a different species. Mm. And they produce pearls, and that's where they got the name. Freshwater pearl isn't valuable, whereas the seawater pearl is. Mm. Now, when I was a child, I used to walk up the river with my cousin, Jim Quigley from Limerick, and we used to collect um, Margatifera Margatifera. We didn't know at the time how valuable this species was as an indicator of water quality, and also, the length of time that these, these species can live for nearly 200 years. They're the longest lived bivalve in the world, as far as I know. Um, you seem to have a lot of technical. Freshwater bivalve. Are they, are you have a lot of. Producing? But then, then again, I have a degree in freshwater fisheries. Well, that's why I was wondering where you got all these funny names from. Yeah? <laughs> are are the, those mussels reproducing, or are they just staying? I, numbers. last year and the year before, by chance, I discovered juvenile um, wow. Margatifera on the own weed, so we still That's have brilliant. juveniles. But I think the reason we have them is because of the climate change over the last few years. High velocity water probably suits them better oh. than low water conditions like we've had right. this year. 
So maybe that's the reason they've reproduced. One of the biggest problems for Margatifera is there is an awful lot of peat in the water mm. and because of the siltation that peat causes and well the high silt levels that are caused mm -hmm. by cutting the bogs, mm -hmm. <coughs> they're actually living in the, um, the bed of the river. So they actually they actually end up getting choked. Choked. And they die oh, over okay. time. So there's very few of them left um, overall. This is why, as he mentioned in the speech there, Delphi is one of the most important rivers left because they still have reproduction going mm. on on Delphi on a regular basis. Mm. But um, these species are amazing because they do live for possibly on average about 140 years. Um, the juveniles live their free swimming and they have a symbiotic relationship with salmon. Um, I won't go into it in detail, but they eventually settle within uh, it's two days to two weeks. I'm not sure with that species. They will settle into the sediment of the river. And when they settle onto the sediment, they have um, a visus, which is a muscle, which holds onto the stones. They can never move again, but they're filter feeders. So they actually clean the water column. Um, and that's why one of the invasive species has had such a huge impact. Um, zebra mussels, which they have on Loch Mask and on Carob and on the Moy, on the Liffey, on the Shore, on the, Mo on the Noor. Most of the big rivers in the country have an invasive species of one sort or another. Now, what's zebra going to happen mussels, at the end of uh, this invasion? They wipe out the native fauna of flora. And are there any advantages themselves? Um, well, the zebra mussels mm. have led to higher quality water mm. in the Shannon because they're filter feeders and mm. they clean the water column. Mm. So if there's a lot of pollution and you've high numbers of these filter feeders, they actually improve the water quality. Will, will the zebra mussels dry out themselves then? They don't they live are... long, um, but oh, they, they, don't long. they don't live that long. I think it's about 18 months to 24 months. Yeah. They reproduce fast and their population levels are so high that when they were initially discovered in around 1991, um, they were in low levels, but you're talking billions upon billions upon billions mm -hmm. of these um, filter feeders in every river they get into. They have major problems with them on the Great Lakes in Canada and they spend billions each year trying to control their populations. Um, because they have huge impacts on flood relief schemes where, for example, you've got um, weirs that have to be opened and closed. Um, on the Great Lakes, they have canal systems and they have to be able to open um, weirs along the water courses. And unfortunately, these ever mussels interfere with this, so they have to put a lot of money into trying to control these species reproducing. And because they are exotic pests, they're not native to our waters and they cause major problems to the natural fauna and flora. But can they, can they be controlled? It, they can, but only to a degree. Mm. We, can't, we cannot mm. remove them. Do you, do, you, do you watch what's going on in this river now, do you? Or the local rivers? I mean, you're, you're, you're an amateur, you're, I mean, you're professional, but you're, well, it's not your job, like, yeah. Well, no, I keep an eye on things, but yeah. as far as I know, we don't have any zebra mussels in Westport yet. Mm. But in general, about all the different fish that are in it or not in it, or... I keep an eye on them. Yeah. And can you spot them as you go along, or are you sticking, I, in, I you sticking a net now and again, or...? No, I wouldn't stick in a net <laughs> now and again. No, only the... I grew up netting salmon, but yeah. um, I... I've done some research work. Mm, I, I mm. worked on the carob, on um, migration of eels in 1992, nine, 2002, 2003. I did a project on the migration of Anguilla Anguilla, the mm. European eel, and mm. I discovered a lot about that species. Mm. And the many that come up this river now? Yeah, and we even nowadays, they yeah. would migrate this river as well. No, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be commercially fished because mm. it's not viable. Mm. Most of the rivers that are commercially would have been commercially fished 
have big lakes. Mm. There are no big lakes on this yeah. water system, and there's none on the Balclare, the own way system. So but there's, there's still be a fair few here, there would? Yeah, yeah, mm. we still have a good... Do you see them here? Have you seen them? Um, I see what's that one, I one ever, yeah. I haven't been watching this year. Mm. But you see them, Pat, yeah. Good la- uh, there's been a good long, long time. Run. It's a long, long time. time since... Jeez, I've one time you should go out there, Murr Scavi, and you turn over a stone and the... They'll be everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Mm. They would mm. seem to be so much more. Unfortunately, yeah. the, like a lot of other species, they have... Their populations have collapsed as mm. well. Through the interference of ourselves. Mm. And pollution and mm. environmental change and really a lot more besides. Yeah. 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 But the tide, when you'll see the eels migrating down from this river mm. is from September into November. As the days shorten and the nights mm. get longer, the silver eels migrate down into the estuary and they go from there to the Sar- uh, into the Atlantic and migrate out to the Sargasso Sea where they reproduce. And only in the last two years, they've proven that it is the Sargasso Sea. They've always believed that that's where they reproduce, but they've been able to use technology to prove it now. The tag them a couple of Irish scientists <coughs> were amongst the ones that proved that. They use technological equipment, but they use monitoring equipment using tags, and they've been able to monitor the eels as far as I know. The biggest problem with the eels is that. They go down to huge depths, they could be migrating at 5,000 feet. <laughs> so most technology won't survive mm. at the pressures of that depth. So mm. it's only in recent times they've been able to monitor. And eels will live up to 60 years in the fresh water. The big eels are females and the males are the small ones. But there's another thing, males and females now they believe that eels have the ability to change sex. Oh. Maybe this is yeah. one of the reasons why they haven't become extinct. <laughs> 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 so, there's another one for There's another one for, for the Pope. <laughs>